I'm Rudy, one of the elders here at the Bridge Church. Uh, it is my privilege, it is my honor, it is my joy to welcome you here today. So if you're here in the room with us, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is good to see your faces. Well, at least like half of your faces. Uh, if you're online, uh, welcome as well. I don't get to see you, but uh, we're just happy to have you join us, uh, however that is. Um, you do have a responsibility. Uh, communication cards. Yep, we're going there right away. So it's on the app. It's on the website. Uh, if you could uh, dig that up, uh, take a look at it, fill it out, uh, and tell us how you're doing. Um, if you have a praise, uh, share that. We want to be able to rejoice with you. If you have uh, uh, just something that's uh, attacking you, uh, tell us that too. We want to be able to pray that through with you. Uh, and if you have uh, stuff that you just, uh, you just need to be heard, heard, you need to have God show up in your life, tell us that too. Uh, we want to be there to seek him with you. Uh, announcements, you all received those when you came in. I am not going to drain the program, uh, but I will share uh, just a, a note that uh, we're not doing communion today. That's going to be next Sunday, so that's something to look forward to. And uh, let's pray. Father God, Father God, thank you uh, for what you're doing um, in our world. Thank you for what you're doing through the Bridge Church and everybody that's uh, part of our church family. Uh, we would just ask that that you be here today, uh, that you would have your hand on uh, Pastor Jerry, uh, that you've already prepared him with words that are going to impact us, that you would pr uh, just put our hearts in a place where uh, we're leaving the troubles of the world uh, purposely aside, uh, and that we're leaning in toward what you would uh, say to us, that we would hear your words, and that we'd, we'd, we'd move towards application. We would just take hold of everything and allow you to transform us. Uh, Lord, we also just pray for our world. Uh, we pray for the upcoming election. Uh, we just pray for your presence, your peace, your wisdom, that we would not put our faith in the people running for election, but rather we would put our faith in you um, and, that, and that you would be present uh, through this week. Uh, in your holy name we pray. We invite you to stand as we continue our service in um, a time of worship. I would like to read um, Lamentations. Uh, it should be up here on the screen for you to follow along. Um, verses 21 through 26. Um, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord.
what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hope my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can sing all this mine yet not I but through Christ in me The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold. has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus
God, let that be the prayer that we have, that all of this is not us, but it's Christ through you. And we pray that you would give us that deep hope and that deep abiding in you um, so that we, we can wait patiently for you and we can trust you that you are faithful through all generations. Thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take a seat. The kids are playing, are laughing, joyful. It's like a whole world to them because for the first time they have received this precious gift. Operation Christmas Child gives our church an opportunity to touch the world. It's a great adventure to evangelize. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes. They're helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. This is the good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. Getting people locally to think globally. What I love about OCC is that they are intentional about pouring into the lives of kids. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. It's a great tool, an effective tool to reach communities with the gospel of Jesus. It's exciting to get people to heaven, but it's also exciting to get heaven to people. Good morning. I am so excited to tell you about Operation Christmas Child and that we're going to participate as a church. Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And that is what we are doing with Operation Christmas Child because every child gets a booklet in their box that tells them about Jesus and they also have the opportunity to participate in a 12-week course learning about Jesus called The Greatest Journey. So I have today boxes for you that you can pick up after the service. All the information is inside. Um, there's this flyer. You can pick a boy or a girl, different ages. There's also a follow your box label. You can fill that out online, and then you can see where your box went um, and what country it went to, which is really cool. And um, then I also have some additional information of items that you can buy for a boy or a girl, depending on your age group. And um, then you bring the box back here, um, either November 8th, 15th, or the 22nd, which is the last day to bring your box back. And um, if you're not attending, I will be at the bridge office um, Friday from 1 to 4. I will have boxes for you uh, that you can pick up, but we'd be happy to deliver as well. So my email address is um, in the program, and also... Um, it's in the announcement sheet. You can contact me, and I'd be happy to deliver. Um, I just wanted you to know that um, thank you for being a part of Operation Christmas Child to bring joy and the gospel to children all over the world. And remember, I can't do this, that in a day and age where so many things are canceled, the gospel isn't canceled. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, very much. What a way, an opportunity for us to use our resources to bless other people and uh, a bridge to the gospel as well. So grateful to be here in person with you and it's, I love to see faces at the bridge. So thank you so much for being here. And if you're at home today, and I know more and more are turning in to our live worship, um, thanks so much for being here today. Um, 
Today we're going to talk about a, uh, a difficult passage for me, so if I'm awkward, you'll know why. Um, it's a passage I've taught many different times. I've taught the subject before, but in this day and age, it just feels so much differently to me. So I'm going to start with the hard part. Here we go. August 20th, 1619 is the date in history when the first African slaves arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. The official count was 20 and odd. There was a few extra that just didn't deserve a number. They had been kid kidnapped by Portuguese from Angola. When they left the west coast of Africa in 1619 by ship, there were about 350 Africans on board kept below the decks. 146 never survived the voyage across the Atlantic. Before they arrived in Virginia, because there was a triangle where they, they went into the southern hemisphere into New Spain first, and then they came up north, and then they went to Europe. But um, when they were uh, coming, they were, uh, the ship was attacked by two privateer ships and 60 of the Africans uh, were taken hostage. And they were, t and about, that's where the 20 and odd came from that arrived in Virginia after all of that. Over the next 300 plus years, at least 12 and a half million Africans um, were shipped to the New World. About 10.7 million survived the voyage. About 5 million Africans uh, were enslaved in Brazil. 3 million were enslaved in the Caribbean islands. 388,000 were sent to North America. They were treated as property without human rights. They often experienced physical abuse and sometimes sexual abuse. They experienced, some experienced torture and some were beaten to death. They were continually treated as inferiors. Some whites believed that the blacks were cursed by God and they used the Bible to back that up. Their value was determined by their usefulness. Husbands could be separated from their wives if their master chose to sell one of them. Kids could be separated from their parents for life. Their living conditions were often dreadful. According to the um, 1860 census, these 20 plus odd had grown in America to 3,953,760. They counted them, but not as equals. And that was 13% of the U.S. population in that time. The issue of slavery, as you know, divided our country into civil war, the North against the South. Slavery and racism uh, is the darkest part of our history. It didn't end with the Civil War. It didn't end with the 13th Amendment. It didn't end 100 years later with the Bill of Civil Rights. Um, racism is woven into our culture. Sadly, the passage we're going to look at today is a passage that was sometimes used by slave owners to control their slaves. It was sort of like using a proof text. They didn't want to teach all of the Bible to their slaves, but they had specific verses that they wanted the people that they owned to apply. And they didn't want slaves to know about the book of Exodus, for example. That was a common idea because God's people were slaves for 400 years. And then God brought them freedom. So uh, we're going we're gonna to start with 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read that. I'm going to start with verses 18 through, through 20 as we continue in our study in 1 Peter. So here's the difficult part of the passage, verse 18. Slaves, 
in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing good and you endure it? Uh, Excuse me, let me read that verse again. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Now, I admit that I can start with the application, and, I'm, and let's just look at the application right away. My work matters to God even in adversity. I can just jump to that principle, and you know, through the years, the many times I've taught this passage, or the Colossians passage, or the Ephesians passage, or the First Timothy passage, it's just, that's an application for us. We, we don't have slavery. Uh, we have slavery in the world, but we don't live under slavery in, in the United States. So that's, that's where we're going with the application. I think it's a fair one. My work does matter to God. Um, in verse 18, if we apply it to, to us right away, God cares about my attitudes and actions in the workplace. This is true. Look at verse 18. Slaves in reverent fear of God submit to your masters. And, and we can make that application to, to uh, the, our employers, uh, our, our supervisors, to, to, to people that we uh, work for or serve. Um, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only those who are uh, good and considerate, but to those who are harsh. Now, let's go back to the first century. Let's go back to Peter. Peter is writing to Christians in the first century Roman empire. Up to one-third of the Roman empire included slaves. That's a pretty huge number. Um, Slaves came from, this is something a little bit different, slaves came from all nations and all skin colors. It wasn't just a racial issue. Slaves were sometimes taken in captive in war. Um, And so there were all kinds of people subjugated during the Roman Empire. Slaves sometimes sold themselves. This was a legitimate part of the financial institution that they could sell themselves because of their own poverty or debt and they could become indentured servants, and they would work to gain their freedom from debt. And it was designed that you would be able to pay off your debt and then have freedom. Um, Most slaves during the first century uh, were employed and received wages. some, yes, were, were uh, treated awfully and uh, they, they experienced degradation and, and abuse. Many in the first century were highly educated or highly skilled in the trades. There were physicians and lawyers and teachers and even sea captains. Some were entrusted with the care of their master's families. Some were responsible stewards in running large businesses. And most were allowed to earn their freedom by the age of 30. Peter writes to those who are enslaved in this particular situation. Why? We go back to verse 13 from last week, where Peter writes, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So Peter is writing, Submit to your masters for the Lord's sake to represent Jesus to your masters, even if they're harsh. Okay, this is a hard one for us. It's really a difficult passage for us. Now, here's the glaring issue. What about slavery in the Bible? You know, that's a really good question, and I don't have all the answers, and... 
I hope I have a reasonable explanation, but I don't have all the answers, and I'm going to be able to ask God one day more about this whole subject. Um, why is there slavery in the Bible? Well, first of all, God didn't create people to be enslaved or to enslave others. That was never his purpose. God created all people in his image with dignity and value. And, and, and God so loved every person that he, he sent his son, Jesus. Um, God created humans originally without sin. In Genesis 3, it, the whole story gets changed because of sin enters the human race. And hearts become prone to evil. Human slavery never had its source in God's heart. Human slavery uh, was sourced in human depravity. It became uh, a way of financial gain for some because slavery was cheap labor. And it became a way for one group of people to control another group of people, a group that viewed themselves as being superior to control a group that they deemed inferior. God allowed slavery. Human slavery is evil. And by the way, there is sin in the world if you didn't, if, you know, there's still evil here. And then there's us, because we bring evil with us as well. And Jesus had to die for us. And we're still not perfect yet. Um... God didn't create slavery, he didn't design it, and he didn't instigate it. That was the human heart. Now, when you think about the created order, we go back to how God designed things. We know in Genesis chapter 2, God created a man and a woman, and that the two of them could become united in marriage. And that was God's order. God did not create divorce. God has allowed divorce, and he's, he's, he's uh, even um, wanting to rebuild lives after. Um, there are a lot of things in this world that God didn't create or design, but he's allowing, and we haven't reached a final judgment yet. So, Peter is writing to his world. He's writing to help those in his church, churches to be able to live and respond and to cope and adapt. Peter's purpose was not to be a social revolutionary. That would have been difficult with a third of the population of the Roman Empire. Uh, most of them probably would have been annihilated if there was some kind of rebellion. His, his purpose was not to overthrow the social structure of the Roman Empire. His purpose was to change human hearts and transform lives. His purpose was to expose sin and help people identify their own hearts and to uh, communicate with them who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for them when he died on the cross so that they could experience cleansing and forgiveness and begin to follow Christ. Interesting thing about the concept of slavery in the Bible and especially in the New Testament, it's an important metaphor that God uses because we were once slaves to sin and we've gained our freedom through Christ. And we can be enslaved to a lot of different things. We don't like slavery, but we can be enslaved to, to a lot of different things. You know, we can, be, we can be enslaved to things like alcohol and drugs, we can, we can be enslaved to pornography. Um, we can be enslaved to food. There's, there's just a lot of things about bondage. We can be enslaved to a debt and just wanting more and more and not being able to afford it. And so we just keep, keep going after it. Um, We've been slaves to sin, and now we have the opportunity to be slaves of righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul encourages those who are enslaved to gain their freedom if it's, if it's possible for them. 
And of course, the, the approach would be gain your freedom in a God-honoring way, if you can. And I know I can think of all the abusive situations and the evil and where slaves, had, you know, they, they would just be executed or brutally abused. And it's like they don't have any way. And yes, that's been true of the human condition for thousands of years. That happens. God didn't create it. God didn't design it. God doesn't endorse it. God never has endorsed slavery as a system. Good news is there's going to be no slavery in heaven. Um, God instructs his people on how to live in a system to represent Christ. Last week, we talked about submission to the government. We don't always like government. We don't always like what they say or what they do. But we have a responsibility. If, if they aren't asking us to do something as sinful, we have the responsibility to uh, submit and to follow instructions. God, just like in submission to government, God would never expect someone to submit to sin. God would never expect someone to submit to immorality. But I know that there is sexual abuse. There has been sexual abuse among slaves. Um, Christ followers are to place God's commands always. Um, there's a higher law that's God's, and, and, and Christ followers are always to value that first. That may not gain their freedom, but that's what God has called us to do. Sadly, as I mentioned, some use the Bible to control their slaves by taking, taking passages out of context. Um, there's stories of, of, of slaves like Nat Turner and Frederick Doug Douglass who were once slaves and they gained their freedom and they both became followers of Christ and they both read the Bible. And... Um, as they did, they realized that the Christianity they had experienced in the South was not the Christianity of the Bible, and that there was freedom in Christ, and that there was hope, um, and that the slave owners uh, that they had experienced are evil men. Um, not only that, but that Many black Americans and white Americans who were abolitionists, that is, opposed to slavery uh, during this time, were committed Christians, and they sought to bring social justice, and they really helped bring it about in the 1860s. The civil rights movement was based on biblical values and biblical pr principles, and even the whole protesting peacefully was a model on how to deal with um, systemic problems in our country. Okay, let's look at verse 19 and 20. I'm going to jump right to my conclusion, or my application. God desires my submission to my employer for the sake of honoring him. God does care about our attitudes and actions, as we saw in verse 18. We don't live under human uh, slavery, but we live under authority with our, in our workplace. We have employers, we have supervisors, uh, we have boards. Some of us may be self-employed and we're responsible to God, uh, but God desires me to honor Him in all that I do. In verse 21, um, Peter writes, I'm back to 19 and 20. God wants me to honor him by voluntarily choosing to be submissive to my employer, to my supervisor, and, or my foreman. Uh, and that's how this passage applies to us. In verse 19, uh, Peter writes, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain and unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Sometimes... People are treated unfairly in the workplace and they're snubbed and they're passed over for a promotion or for a raise. Sometimes uh, there are politics at the office. For people who follow Christ, retaliation is not what God is looking for. God is looking for people who will follow Jesus. Verse 20, 
But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? Sometimes Christ followers are disciplined in the workplace. Sometimes they're suspended in the workplace. And sometimes they even lose their jobs because of their own stupidity, the way they handled, the way they dishonored God. Sometimes that happens. God is looking for people who follow Jesus. There is no merit in suffering because of our own sin or failure. But if you suffer for doing good, Peter writes, and you endure it, this is commendable for God. This is a strategy that God has to shine brightly in the world. In America, we are all about freedom. That's why this is so touchy for us. We, we have rights, we want our rights, yet God has called us to a higher standard uh, to represent Christ first before our own rights. Uh, sometimes that may mean turning the other cheek. Sometimes it means I'm not going to seek revenge, I want to. That's God's job to take care of that. Sometimes it means I need to forgive first. Sometimes it means loving my enemies. That's a different standard in the world we live in. So, my work matters to God, even in adversity. Facing COVID, that changes the work environment. Facing a hostile political culture every day, that just raises the stress level a little bit. Facing uncertain times, uh, seeing protests and violence on TV every day. So, my work matters to God even now. Also, my role model is always Jesus, verses 21 through 25. My role model is always Jesus, even in adversity. Um, again, that's where we are with the application. We go right to 21 and 22, and I'm called to follow in Jesus' steps. One step at a time, we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 21, Peter writes, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. This is a hard truth. Jesus suffered and died for us on the cross, and he wants us to follow in his steps. He sacrificed his life for us. He is our ultimate role model. He is our example on how to live, how to face adversity one day at a time. And may we look to him to lead us through adversity because he is our hope. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 12. He said, when, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Because we live in a pretty dark world, and we just kind of become more and more aware of it. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Following Jesus' example Walking in the light is how we're going to represent Christ, is how we're going to honor Christ, is how we're going to deal with evil in our world. In verse 22, um, Peter goes to Isaiah 53, 9 from the Old Testament, about 800 years before Peter writes here, and uh, Peter pulls this out. He says, He, referring to Jesus, committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. This was a prophecy about Messiah, the one we call the Christ. And Jesus didn't commit any sin. Jesus spoke truth. He was never afraid to speak truth. But he did not bad mouth or belittle or tear down those who caused his suffering. Jesus had a higher cause than to retaliate. You know, that 
human response to get back. We want justice, and we will make it happen if no one else will. Verse 23, I'm, I am to entrust myself fully into God's hands. And we, we again um, go to Isaiah 53. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus was laughed at. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was beaten. He was nailed to the cross. He didn't call anybody a name. He did not swear. He did not power up to prove how strong he was. He could have, but he understood there's a higher responsibility. He understood he was to do the Father's will because that's why the Father sent him. He hasn't called me to do Jesus, the Father's will as G Jesus, uh, at least not yet. We, we don't have to worry about crucifixion. In, in our country. Jesus submitted to the highest authority over him, his own father. And that was the father's will. And notice this next section here. Instead, instead, he, Jesus, entrusted himself to the judge who judges justly. Jesus put his, uh, his life into the hands of his father, the one who knows perfect justice. Jesus gave his life back to God. Even though he suffered, even though it was hard, even though it was painful, he, he entrusted himself into the Father's will for his life. Question for us, can we do that? Can you and I entrust ourselves totally into God's care, totally into God's leading, totally into God's will, and what he wants for us. Uh, Romans 12.1 is a good reminder. And Paul writes, after, after he writes 11 chapters in the book of Romans about the meaning and significance of the death of Christ, he finally gets to a very significant command. There's only uh, two commands in Romans 6 before. So 11 chapters without any commands except Romans 6. And then we come to Romans 12. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's how we can entrust ourselves to God, the one who judges justly, by offering ourselves, our, our total being, back to God. Submission. Verses 24 and 25, I have hope because of all that Jesus accomplished for me. I have hope. It makes a huge difference. Verses 24 and 25, Peter uh, continues with Isaiah 53. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Jesus died in our place as our substitute. That's what Isaiah was writing about. He himself bore our sins in his body. Uh, he paid for our sins. He, he set us free from slavery to sin. And we don't have to be locked into sin. We can overcome it. Now we are to die to sin because of Jesus' victory over sin. Now we are to live for righteousness. When we choose sin, we choose rebellion against God, and sin is alive in us. Um, when we walk with Jesus, following in his footsteps, we choose righteousness. And sin does not live in us when we follow in Jesus' footsteps. Peter continues quoting Isaiah 53, by his wounds you've been healed. Uh, Christ's suffering brought spiritual healing to us, brought us forgiveness, brought us cleansing, brought us a new life in Christ. And personally, I don't think this is about physical healing, that there's healing in the atonement. 
Jesus can heal anybody, anytime, whenever he wants. I don't think the purpose here is to talk about the total uh, healing of, of people spiritually, of the chief problem that we have. He says in verse uh, 25, For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Like sheep, wandering away from the shepherd. By the way, in the Bible, the shepherd is not a wimpy wimpy term. We often have seen pictures of Jesus holding a little lamb. Well, that's, that's a great picture. That's probably how Jesus approaches kids. But Jesus is a shepherd. He is a leader, and he is out front uh, doing battle for the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And he is a strong, powerful leader. And he's the shepherd of our souls. And he's the overseer of our souls. Think about that. He's, He's your supervisor. He's your boss. And we are responsible to his authority. The Apostle Paul uh, picks up in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, this idea that Peter raises in verse 24, when he talks about dying to sin, he said, uh, Paul writes, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. He's saying when Jesus was crucified, and I placed my faith in Christ, I identify with Christ's death. Jesus died for me back then. It applies to me today. And now I can be dead to sin. Now I have the uh, resources to overcome sin. And I no longer live. The old self no longer lives. But Christ lives in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. The life I now live, Paul writes, in the body, in the flesh where I face temptation, where I have to deal with sin on a daily basis, in this life, in this body, I live by faith. I have to trust God. I have to trust, I have to follow Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. He laid down his life. This is the Christian life, Galatians 2.20. It's not always easy. So, because I've been crucified with Christ, now I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not all things that I want, but all things that He wants me to do. I have those resources. I have that strength. Do we have great freedom in the United States? And we all like justice and we all like our rights. How are we going to apply this directly to us today? I just want to kind of leave us with this question Would you rather be free from sin or free from people in authority over you that you don't like? I think it's a good question to think about. Would you rather be free from sin or free from the people in authority over you that you don't like? Would you rather walk in Jesus' footsteps or create your own path? Would you stand with me and let's pray. Father, we we just stand before you today and acknowledge that uh, this is a hard passage. The whole concept of human slavery is kind of unimaginable. And the, the abuses that we have learned through the years, um, the abuse in history, and the evil of people's hearts, and how people have suffered and died because of slavery. And our hearts grieve about that, and our hearts grieve about human trafficking in our world today. God, may you continue to do a good work in raising up people to help become a solution to human trafficking. 
And thank you for those people, and those believers in our world that support and give and um, volunteer and serve in the area of uh, overcoming human trafficking. God, may we be uh, people who take your authority seriously. It's uh, sometimes hard to compare our job situations with slavery, and yet we do have authority over us that you've placed, and we are responsible in how we, uh, how we act, how we behave, our, our attitudes and actions. They reflect directly on Jesus, and they have a direct impact on the kingdom of God. Father, at this time, I want to pray also for our nation as we approach Election Day. For those who haven't voted God, I pray that you will guide and give wisdom. Please uh, direct our nation. Um, may we, as the people of God, honor you and how we respond, um, whoever our president is. May we represent Jesus well. Thank you that you have given us your word, even when it's hard sometimes. And for Jesus' sake and in his name, I pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today, church. Um, next week, we're going to be celebrating communion. That'll be a sealed communion like we've done in the past. And uh, you can pick one up when you walk into the service, and, and then we'll, we'll share that time at the end of our service. If you're at home and you want to pick up the sealed communion uh, at the offices, we're going to make that available, I think, on Friday afternoon. And if, you, uh, if you'll just let us know, we will be glad to make that available. And I think somebody is even willing to deliver to your home if uh, you need that as well. So we are to follow Jesus and walk in his steps. God bless you all. We're dismissed.